Hello everyone! During the last year, I have run lots of galvanic metal plating experiments, and I have accumulated a lot of used electrolytes, which have turned into chemical waste. For various reasons, they no longer work, which is why I have to either dispose of them as scrap or recycle them myself. That is why in today's video, I am going to share with you how I extracted different metals such as platinum, gold and copper from my chemical waste. I have got copper sulfate and nickel solutions, and also gold and platinum electrolytes, which I used for coating various items with precious metals. I think we can start with simple things and then gradually increase the level of complexity. I decided to start with copper, because these bottles mainly contain copper sulfate mixed with sulfuric acid and different impurities. I decided to extract the metal itself from these solutions, using electrolysis and without using chemical reagents. The only thing which is challenging here is the choice of electrodes. I can use any piece of copper as cathode, or in other words, negative electrode. I happen to have a piece of copper foil at hand, but as an anode, I need to use some inert material. Here I have a practically indestructible titanium anode covered in ruthenium and iridium oxides. You can also use graphite anodes instead of it, but they frequently break down when used and can contaminate solutions with carbon particles. That is why it is better to buy such an anode once and not to torment yourself using graphite. After putting together the setup and connecting the electrodes, I decided to steer the mixture with a magnetic steer. Thus we can intensify the current, which will make the process run quicker and the copper will be deposited in the form of metal rather than flakes. From the chemical point of view, the process is quite simple. Copper is deposited into the cathode and on the anode oxygen is being released. As a result, when current is applied, copper sulfate solution is divided into copper and sulfuric acid. The entire process took about 12 hours to complete. After that, the solution became practically transparent and all the copper from the blue solution deposited on the cathode, which got much heavier and thicker because of the deposited layer of copper. The new layers of metal are easily to remove from the copper foil, and we can see that after the electrolysis, the metallic copper deposited on the copper foil is quite shiny and pure. It weighs 62 grams. By the way, this analytical weighting scale can even detect the additional weight created by oxidation of the freshly produced porous copper in the ear. After separating copper from the sulfuric acid, I filtered the obtained solution and am saving it for later use. Maybe I will need this acid with light copper impurities. After dealing with copper, I decided to take on nickel, because I thought that recycling nickel electrodes will be just as easy as recycling copper. I was so mistaken. I have accumulated several bottles with electrolytes for nickel plating, which as far as I remember certainly contain a mixture of nickel sulfate and nickel chloride, and seems like they also contain copper impurities. But I don't really remember. Just like I did with copper, I have assembled the same setup, in which I use the very same indestructible electrode as an anode, and as a cathode, I used a piece of nickel sponge. After all the preparation, I turned on the stirrer again and started applying current, and I left it to run for 12 hours. It turned out that there was quite a lot of copper impurity in the solution, which deposited on the electrode and the bottom of the container. To remove it, I swapped the nickel cathode for a copper one, in order to separate copper from nickel in the solution. Ten hours later, it became apparent how much copper impurity there was in the solution, because a large amount of metallic copper sank to the bottom of the container. Besides, it turned out that nickel almost didn't deposit during electrolysis, 
with the inert anode, which is why practically pure copper is the form of such fine powder deposited on the bottom and on the cathode, apparently because of the sulfuric acid being formed. The freshly extracted nickel immediately dissolved and didn't have time to deposit on the cathode. I filtered the extracted copper powder and left it to dry. After that, I proceeded to extract nickel from the solution. I decided to use a steel plate instead of the inert anode for extracting nickel. It will be substituting nickel atoms in the solution with iron atoms. When I use the inert anode, nickel just won't get extracted. I use the same nickel sponge as a cathode. In theory, pure and shiny nickel is supposed to coat it, just as I did before. To speed up the entire process and increase the current, I stirred the solution. I had to wait for additional 16 hours and after that the results were not that impressive. Instead of a shiny nickel coating, black loose and fragile nickel coating deposited on the cathode and most of this metal sank to the bottom in the form of powder. However, the biggest problem was that the solution was contaminated with carbon released by the steel plate. I reckon the only way I can separate nickel from carbon is by using a magnet. Fortunately, nickel is a ferromagnetic and I managed to collect most of the nickel from powder from the bottom of the container with the help of a powerful neodymium magnet. I rinsed it with some 50% ethanol solution. After that, before melting it, I left it to dry, just like copper. While nickel and copper are drying, it's time to deal with precious metals, and I'm going to start with platinum. From the experiment for my previous video, I have some electrolyte for rough platinum plating left. Why rough plating? That's because it almost doesn't contain any unchanging additives and consists of 0.1% hexachloroplatinic acid solution. This substance is created when metallic platinum is dissolved in aqua regia. It's quite easy to extract such platinum from such a liquid using sodium formate or in other words sodium salt of formic acid. To begin with, I'm preparing a 10% solution of sodium formate using 8 grams of 85% formic acid and 6 grams of sodium hydroxide. And after mixing, I'm increasing the total volume to 100 ml. For this reaction, the solution as well as the platinum containing solution need to be heated up to their boiling temperatures. After that, the platinum solution will need to be neutralized with sodium bicarbonate in order to turn the chloroplatinic acid into sodium hexachloroplatinate. When running this reaction, I used a bit too much sodium bicarbonate, which caused the solution to grow turbid. To fix this, I started removing vestiges of sodium bicarbonate with the help of formic acid until the turbidness disappeared. After tasting the solution with pH paper, I realized that the solution was too acidic and that platinum won't get extracted. To neutralize the solution again, I started adding small quantities of sodium bicarbonate into the heated solution. After reaching a weak alkaline solution, fine black platinum powder began to be extracted from the solution. As soon as it happened, I added some hot sodium formate solution prepared beforehand to the beaker. Now I need to boil this solution for about 30 minutes in order to extract all platinum from it and also in order for the sediment to be more granule and easier to filter. Some time later, the small platinum particles from the solution clotted and sank to the bottom as pure platinum. Now I can easily filter it and wait for it to dry before melting it. While all metals are drying there, I decided to recycle my electrolyte for gold plating. In my previous videos, I used it to gold plate a cup and different other items. Because of that, the concentration of gold in the solution is critically low and it doesn't work as well as it used to. Besides, I still have some gold containing solutions in which gold is present in the form of a complex compound 
called potassium hexocyanoate. That is why zinc cementation will fit well for extracting gold from this solution. To do that, I'm adding 50 grams of the fine zinc powder in order for it to substitute gold in the solution. For the reaction to complete, I leave this mixture heating for 10 hours. Some time later, the solution changed its color from yellow to pale blue and a white zinc hydroxide sediment sank to the bottom. First, I'm pouring out the upper transparent layer of the liquid into another beaker and pouring in some concentrated sodium hydroxide solution, thus this oxide of zinc should dissolve. After everything has dissolved and settled, I poured out the upper layer of the solution and added some concentrated hydrochloric acid in order to wash away vestiges of zinc powder. After dissolving zinc and rinsing several times with dilute hydrochloric acid, there is some sediment left on the bottom. Apparently, this is gold with iron impurities. I'm going to filter and dry this sediment. As a result of all my experiments, I have got several sediments of different metals, so I think it's time to begin melting them. To do that, I'm going to use my new hydrogen burner. The temperature of its flame can reach over 2700 degrees Celsius. We can start with the gold sediment. Since there can be vestiges of iron in the sediment, I decided to burn it with a stream of oxygen, along with a paper filter. After that, I collected everything that didn't get magnetized, and decided to melt it in all in most unusual crucible, which was piece of potato. In the comments to my previous videos, many of my subscribers advised me to melt gold in a potato. At first, I thought it was a joke, however, let us try now and see what it's like to melt a gold in a potato. Potato turned out to be one of the best crucibles, and vestiges of gold melted perfectly. The charcoal formed as a result of potatoes burning serves as a heat insulator, which is why gold melted extremely easy. To improve melting, and for small gold drops to stick together, I poured in some borax, which serves as a flux. After melting for some time, I got such a drop of gold. It weighs 2.2 grams, and it costs about 100 euros, which is quite a good result. After gold, I decided to melt platinum powder, which after drying started looking like unremarkable black powder. I decided to melt platinum also in a potato, in order for the fine powder not to get blown away and for it to better stick together, I decided to add a surplus of borax. Because of the extremely high melting temperature of platinum, which is 1700 degrees Celsius, I had to melt it for a long time. After melting, I got such a tiny drop of platinum, which weighs only 0.23 grams, and it doesn't cost much. After dealing with precious metals, I decided to melt my pieces of copper, along with copper powder as well. To do that, I'm loading the graphite crucible with all the copper, and I'm adding several spoons of borax, in order for the copper powder not to oxidize at a high temperature. I'm placing the crucible inside the melting furnace, and I'm setting it to the maximum temperature. After reaching the needed temperature, and melting content of the crucible, I'm pouring molten copper along with leftover borax into the graphite mold I have prepared. After it had hardened, I'm cooling it with the regular spray water. Ta-da! A copper nugget is ready. After removing the borax, I got such a beautiful copper nugget, weighing 142 grams. What about nickel? I sort of came to a standstill with it. I didn't find a big enough potato to accommodate so much nickel powder, and most probably this metal will just burn down because it was a high chemical activity. That is why I am going to save it for later, until I find suitable furnace for melting it with the needed flux. So, now I think you know how to extract some precious metals from different solutions, and also how to melt them in a potato. 
If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to get new more new and interesting.